Hello, Isaac here. Now, in the last video, we had a look at Roman citizenship, what it meant, its history, and how to become one. Now, in this video, we can have a think about how the Apostle Paul, or at least his family, obtained Roman citizenship. Now, the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee Jew born in around 4 BC in Tarsus of Sicilia. He studied in Jerusalem under Gamaliel and would go on to be a persecutor of the early church, overseeing the stoning of Stephen. But on the road to Damascus, he had an experience of the risen Lord and would go on to be an important Christian missionary, establishing many churches in Asia and Europe. During those missionary journeys, we find in the book of Acts that he resorts to claiming the privileges of his Roman citizenship three times. In Philippi, in Jerusalem, and finally in Caesarea when he appeals to Caesar. Furthermore, Acts tells us that his citizenship was bestowed upon him through birth. In other words, he was a Roman citizen because of his father. But that begs the question, how did Paul's father or grandfather become Roman citizens? Now, the demands of Roman citizenship and the Jewish religion were not mutually exclusive. For Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar had granted special concessions for the Jews so that they could maintain their own customs. But it certainly wasn't common, especially in the first century BC. For Paul's family and Jews living in the Roman provinces, there are essentially two routes to become a Roman citizen. That is manumission or special concession, which included rendering a service to Rome or military service. But before we turn to these, it's important to understand the historical background of how the surrounding area of Sicilia, where Paul was from, as well as the whole of Asia Minor, Syria and Judea came under the sway of Roman power and control. Now this story begins the Roman general Pompey the Great. Pompey was given command of the Roman army against Mithridates VI, and after defeating Mithridates, he would turn Bithynia, Pontius and Syria into Roman provinces. But after settling affairs in Syria in 64 BC, the people of Judea called upon Pompey to resolve a dispute between the two Hasmonean brothers, Hyrcanus and Aristobulus, who both vied for the Jewish throne. Hyrcanus was received the endorsement from Pompey and Aristobulus conceded, but his followers responded by seizing Jerusalem. In response, Pompey lay siege to the city and within three months, Jerusalem was retaken, Hyrcanus put on the throne and Judea established as a tribute paying client kingdom. But in those preceding years, trouble was on the horizon as the two great Roman generals, Julius Caesar and Pompey the Great, would vie for power in Rome and become entangled in a civil war in 49 BC. Julius Caesar would eventually come out on top, but after declaring himself dictator for life in 44 BC, he was assassinated by the Senate, and his assassins Brutus and Cassius would seize control over most of the eastern provinces, including Macedonia, Asia Minor and Syria. Nonetheless, the trusted supporters of Julius Caesar, Mark Antony Octavian, would defeat the forces of Brutus and Cassius at two battles fought at Philippi. After this victory, Octavian, Mark Antony and Lepidus would form a triumvirate, splitting Rome's provinces between them. Octavian would rule in the west, Antony in the east and Lepidus in Africa. In the East, however, the Parthians, who supported Brutus and Cassius, invaded Syria in 40 BC. And with their help, Mattathias, the son of the executed ruler Aristobulus, would conquer Jerusalem. And the ruler Hyrcanus was mutilated. But the governor of Galilee, Herod, would escape and make his way to Rome to seek assistance. Herod had the support of Mark Antony. And surprisingly, Despite the fact that he had no claim to power, the Senate decided to make him king of the Jews. Therefore, he would return to Judea with the Roman army to claim the throne. The Roman governor of Syria had managed to expel the Parthians from that region, and when Herod arrived in 39 BC, they conquered the region of Galilee. Then they laid siege to Jerusalem. 
and after 40 days managed to breach the walls and retake the city. Herod would therefore become king of Judea, and his rule would last up until his death in 4 BC, when the kingdom was divided amongst his sons who would become tetrarchs. Therefore, with this historical context in mind, let's return to those two paths by which Paul's family could have obtained Roman citizenship. First, manumission. Now there were two occurrences when a large number of Jews were taken to Rome as slaves. After the fall of Jerusalem in 63 BC with Pompey and in 37 BC with Herod, these Jewish slaves in Rome would eventually be manumitted, normally after a number of years of service and therefore become Roman citizens. Philo affirms his account, telling us of a large Jewish community in Rome under Augustus and that they lived in the district of Rome beyond the Tiber known as Trastevere. He writes, They were mostly Roman citizens, having been emancipated, for, having been brought as captives into Italy, they were manumitted by those who had bought them for slaves. This can be supported by the fact that the oldest Jewish catacomb can be found at Monteverde in Trastevere. This is a series of stamps from the first century BC up until the reign of Diocletian, showing a continuous Jewish presence in that area during that period. The numerical size of the community is difficult to estimate, but there is a reference in Josephus to 8,000 Jews in Rome in 4 BC, indicating that it was fairly sizable. The issue when it comes to Paul's family is whether they maintain their residence in Tarsus and Sicilia for a significant period of time. For as far as we know, the Jews in Rome had been taken from Jerusalem or the surrounding area. And if they had been returned after being manumitted, they would have most likely returned to that area. In other words, his residence in Tarsh is an issue if they gain their citizenship through manumission. But there is an interesting reference in Jerome, and if it's taken as reliable, it would give it some credence. He writes, They say the Apostle Paul's parents were from the region of Giscala in Judea, and that when the whole province was laid waste by the hands of the Romans and the Jews dispersed into the world, they were moved to the city of Tarsus in Sicilia. In other words, his family was brought to Tarsus from Northern Galilee and forced into slavery as part of a Roman suppression of a Judean uprising, which could have been in the aftermath of the recapture of the area by Herod the Great. His family would therefore be manumitted at some point in the preceding years and Paul born a Roman citizen. Another route would have been special concession, which included military service, and there certainly were examples of Jews serving in the Imperial Army. But military service did pose difficulty for Jewish men, particularly in the first century BC, because of their dietary laws and Sabbath observance. Therefore, when voluntary enlistment was the normal method of military recruitment, observant Jews normally refrained from signing up. The problem was that in times of crisis, conscription did apply, and this happened during the civil wars. But we find that during those times, exemptions were given to the Jewish community in the East. For example, the consul Lentulus, who's recruiting for Pompeii in the East in 49 BC, issues an edict exempting those Jews who are Roman citizens and observe and practice Jewish rites. This only applied to Jews who are Roman citizens, but later in 43 BC, when the same problem occurred, the Caesarean governor of Syria, Cornelius Dolabella, reaffirmed the previous rites, but this time applied it to all Jews, regardless of Roman citizenship. In fact, he did this in response to an appeal from the king of Judea, Hyrcanus. According to Josephus, this is the letter sent by Dolabella to all of Asia, and particularly the Ephesians. Alexander, the son of Theodorus, the ambassador of Hyrcanus, the son of Alexander, the high priest and ethnarch of the Jews, appeared before me to show that his countrymen could not go into their armies because they were not allowed to bear arms or to travel on the Sabbath days, nor there to procure themselves those sorts of food which they have been used to eat from the times of their forefathers. I do therefore grant them a freedom from going into the Roman army, as the former prefects have done. Therefore, given the Jewish attitude to serving the Roman military, the problems it posed in terms of dietary habits and Sabbath observance, 
and the exemptions that were given to the Jewish community in the East during the civil wars, it's unlikely that the family of the Apostle Paul would have obtained their Roman citizenship via this route. There is another option, however, when it comes to special concession, and that is that citizenship was granted for rendering a service to Rome. And in particular, there was a strategy of gifting citizenship to the most prominent and wealthy families of a conquered nation in order to gain their favor and loyalty. Now, if the Apostle Paul is from a prominent family in Tarsus, it's possible that they were gifted citizenship during the capture of the city by Pompeii. In fact, Paul's citizenship of Tarsus may well be an indication of his status. For Pompey placed Tarsus under the control of Rome, but they gained the status of a free city by the Emperor Augustus for their efforts during the civil war. The free cities could govern themselves, electing their own magistrates and deciding their own laws. But Athenodorus reformed the constitution of Tarsus in 15 BC, making it a requirement for a payment of 500 drachmae to be a full citizen. This act effectively disenfranchised the majority of the population of Tarsus, transforming it from democracy to an oligarchy, as only the most wealthiest families could afford to be citizens of Tarsus. Dio Chrysostom, in the address to the Tarsians in AD 110, spoke out against this practice. He writes, For it cannot be that by the mere payment of 500 drachmas, a man can come to love you and immediately be found worthy of citizenship, and at the same time that a man who through poverty or through the decision of some keeper of the rolls has failed to get the rating of a citizen, although not only he himself had been born in Tarsus, but also his father and his forefathers as well, is therefore incapable of affection for the city or of considering it to be his fatherland. Besides his Tarsian citizenship, another indicator of his status is the fact that he trained in Jerusalem under one of the most renowned teachers of the time, Gamaliel. Certainly, Paul could have hardly afforded this prominent teacher unless he was from a fairly wealthy family. He was also a member of the sect of the Pharisees, an exclusive group of only 6,000 members, according to Josephus. Nonetheless, the fact that Paul worked a trade for a living as a tent maker has seemed somewhat problematic if he is from a fairly prominent or wealthy family. But there may have been a practice amongst the rabbis at the time of combining Torah study with a learned trade, and he may well have learned his trade during his studies in Jerusalem. From his own account in 1 or 2 Corinthians, he tells us that he has every right to accept payment as a missionary, but he does not want to make use of that right. And this is ground in the fact that he wants to maintain his integrity and freedom as a missionary. But as Ronald Hock has pointed out, the way that he does describe his work is more consistent with someone that has a higher social status. For example, he describes his work as tiring and enslaving. Moreover, his work did not result in upward mobility, but in fact he humbled himself by engaging in the work he did. Therefore, in evaluating the means by which Paul's family became Roman citizens, it's unlikely that it was through the service of a Jewish person in the Roman army. When it comes to manumission, there is a possibility, if we take Jerome's account as accurate, that his family was taken from Northern Galilee to Tarsus during the suppression of an uprising, probably during the time of Herod, and that his family was subsequently manumitted and Paul was born a Roman citizen. The final possibility is that Roman citizenship was gifted to his family by an emperor or general, with Pompey being the strongest possibility, in order to gain their favour and loyalty because they were fairly prominent within the city. Nonetheless, whether it was due to manumission or gifted by an emperor or general, we can certainly say that Apostle Paul had a somewhat privileged background. Given that he was a Roman citizen, a citizen of Tarsus, and a Pharisaic Jew that trained under Gamaliel in Jerusalem. In a sense, he straddled three realms of influence and privilege, Roman, Greek, and Jewish. This would stand him in good stead to be an apostle to the Gentiles and would enable him to freely travel throughout the Roman Empire. 
As Cicero writes, Men of no importance, born in obscure rank, go to sea. They go to places which they have not seen before, where they can neither be known to the men among whom they have arrived, nor always find people to vouch for them. But still, owing to this confidence in the mere fact of their citizenship, they think that they shall be safe. Take away this hope. Take away this protection from Roman citizens. Establish the fact there is no assistance to be found in the words, I am a Roman citizen. And you cut off from the Roman citizens all the provinces, all the kingdoms, all free cities, and indeed the whole world, which has hitherto been open most especially to our countrymen. Therefore the whole world was open to Paul, and he certainly did make use of that. As we said, he established churches throughout Asia Minor and Europe. But in the next videos, as we look at how he uses his Roman citizenship in Acts, it is at times remarkably un-Roman, and is often an inversion of the Roman social priorities. For Paul realized that his Roman, Greek, or Jewish status and privileges counted for nothing compared to the privilege and status of being a child of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, see you next time.